Welcome to the Fire This Times, the podcast bringing you conversations to the intersection of politics, culture, and the environment. I'm your host, Jibra Yoop, and today we'll be talking to Danielle Kurt. She is a Palestinian academic who specializes in comparative politics and international relations. Dana works as a researcher at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and as an assistant professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. We spoke about her most recent book, Polarized and Demobilized Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine, which was published by Hearst. Our topics of discussion ranged from authoritarianism within the Palestinian Authority to the role of the US, the legacy of the 1994 Oslo Accords, we spoke about the Arab Spring, the 2011 Arab Spring and their link to Palestine, we spoke more broadly about how long-term authoritarianism impacts society, we even got into the Abraham Accords, Um, we spoke about how regional authoritarians such as Hezbollah, Assad and Iran are perceived in Palestine, we got into the different generational shifts with examples from Lebanon and Palestine, and we got into her argument as to why reforming the PLO should be something that Palestinians and their supporters uh, start thinking about very seriously. As you can guess, this has been a pretty dense conversation. We spent about an hour discussing these things. Of course, we couldn't get into everything, but I hope this would be a good primer for you. So that's it for me. If you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon or buymeacoffee.com, and you can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one hours, and Buy Me Coffee has both options. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts. The music is by Torah Beat. Thank you for listening and take care. My name is Dana El Kurd. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and a researcher at uh, its sister institution, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. And um, I received my PhD in political science in 2017. And what this book, Polarized and Demobilized. Amazing. Well, first, thanks for talking to me. Let's just start with uh, just an introduction of the book, like an expose of the book. What is it about? How did this study, uh, sorry, how did this study come about? And what is the topic? So um, the, the book is called Polarized and Demobilized Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine. Um, the topic is um, basically how um, uh, international involvement impacted the Palestinian Authority. Uh, particularly American involvement and um, impacted its relationship to Palestinian society. And um, ba- basically I was motivated by a couple of questions. Um, so like I said, I'm a political scientist. I'm interested in the case itself. Um, I'm also Palestinian. So obviously I'm interested in the case itself, but I'm also interested kind of in, in the more general dynamics that can be applied to other cases. Um, so I am um, you know, specialized in like authoritarianism and its effects. And so um, one motivation for the, the project was the Arab Spring and its aftermath. So like we saw these political openings and, and uh, you know, a lot of external intervention in many cases, military and otherwise, and, and societies becoming highly polarized. And um, when, that was when I was, you know, starting grad school. Um, so I wanted to understand like where this sort of polarization was coming from. Why was it so vehement? Um, so you think about like the various Egyptian groups and opposition, like you have a shared goal here, uh, you know, the outgoing regime is, is, should be the target, but they couldn't get past their infighting. Um, and so uh, these kind of polarized dynamics, I also noticed weren't at just at the level of like the political elites, like you could see it in wider society and the discourse people were using about each other. So I, I started to think that maybe, um, you know, longstanding authoritarianism may really have had like a profound impact on societies in ways which we weren't considering. And I wanted to figure out how that worked. Um, so in like poli sci speak um, to disentangle the causal mechanisms. Um, so, so that was, the, that was the, the, you know, the first motivation. And then the second motivation was, was my interest in the case itself, um, be, you know, because I'm concerned about the, the Palestinian issue and I'm concerned about um, the trends we see in you know, Palestinian mobilization or lack thereof, and um, how to move past that. Well, you mentioned the 2011 uprisings, and uh, there'll be a question specifically on that. I guess in terms of timeline, um, like just so in terms of situating and contextualizing the conversation, and like the book focuses a lot on the Oslo Accords and since the Oslo Accords, especially, uh, and their impacts on on Palestinian society and politics. Um, like so. So let's kind of paint this sort of before and after picture as much as we can. People have likely heard of the accords, I'm assuming. 
Uh, but I don't think that direct and indirect impacts are that well known. And I'm saying this as someone who is, you know, I'd like to think of myself as fairly well read. And I've been involved in Palestinian societies in London and in Beirut. Uh, personally, also like part Palestinian. So I, I try and follow as much as I can. But, uh, but <laughs> sometimes I speak Arabic. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm especially thinking of your line and here I'll quote it. Uh, quote, before 1994, Palestinians were highly politicized and organized, despite a sustained loss of land and military occupation, end quote. Since then, and due to this authoritarianism of the PA, the Palestinian Authority, I mean, and obviously of the occupation, quote, civil society organizations became less effective, more isolated, and reported lower levels of trust among members, end quote. So can we sort of get into this a bit more, sort of like a big, big question, but we'll probably be able to dissect it throughout the conversation anyway. But if we can sort of paint a before and after picture as a start, and we'll see how to take it from there. Okay, so um, basically uh, the, the, the Oslo Accords were, were sold as a way to gradually give Palestinians self-rule in West Bank and Gaza. So before, um, you know, they were under the direct, you know, I mean, they continue to be under direct military occupation, but it, there, there wasn't like this other entity between them and the Israeli occupation. And, and um, they were quite heavily repressed and things like this, but you still saw, um, I would say sustained mobilization. And then Palestinian civil society organizations and grassroots organizations um, were quite embedded and um, had a lot of, uh, you know, popularity with, with the Palestinian society. Um, and were quite accountable to Palestinian society. And in some ways, these organizations were like, like maybe they, they weren't like explicitly like political, but they would engage in political uh, uh, um, actions and, and, and be like kind of a focal point for organizing. After the Oslo Accords, we saw something very different. So the idea of the Oslo Accords was like, you know, that the, the Palestinians would be able to establish a state in the Palestinian territories by 1999. Um, and this came after the the first intifada, the first Palestinian uprising, which, you know, to many, this was seen as kind of a victory, like these people who had been under military occupation finally brought the occupier to the negotiating table. Um, but from, from the start, the Oslo Accords were, were quite exclusionary. Um, so uh, Western governments um, only engaged with like a certain subset of the Palestinian political spectrum. Uh, there was there's a recent book out called Promoting Democracy by, by Manal Jamal who who kind of um, gets into the the process at the early you know at the at the start of the um, what she calls a political settlement of the Oslo Accords. So anyway, they were they were not fully you know the Oslo Accords were not fully accepted by everyone, but most people saw it as an opportunity to you know finally be free of military occupation um, and and things like the existing settlements, um, which of course have like metastasized at this point. Um, and 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 the right of return of refugees and all, all the status of Jerusalem, all of these things were left kind of on the table for future negotiations. But people still had, you know, some some hope that like, you know, what was agreed to would come to pass. And many people returned to the West Bank at that point, and and Gaza, and, and many Palestinians abroad gave up their lives to to come back and and try to rebuild the country. So, the Palestine um, Liberation Organization, which was considered the, the, you know, the National Liberation Movement of the Palestinians is considered the representative of the Palestinian people. Um, that leadership also entered into the West Bank, you know, um, and 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 uh, and Gaza, and 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 actually came to the you know historic Palestine for the first time. Um, and and the Oslo Accords uh, allowed basically for the creation of this you know governing apparatus of the West Bank and Gaza called the Palestinian Authority, intended to build you know these state institutions and ministries and things like this. And then it divided uh, the territories and particularly the West Bank into area A, B, and C, where the Palestinian Authority was basically only allowed to function in, in certain areas. Um, so the idea was eventually to, to, to get access to all of these areas, but that never happened because um, you know, Israel never really intended for that to happen. But um, so basically like today, most Palestinians live in um, area A. So um, that's that's like about 18 percent of the territory and then uh th so that's 55 percent of the palestinian people living in 18 percent of the territory and then 41 percent of palestinians live in area b which is about um, 20 percent of the territory and only uh so 62 percent of the territory which is considered area c uh one percent of palestinians live there so palestinian the palestinian authority is allowed to function in area a but in area b they have to kind of share control or like 
you know, um, you know, remove themselves from Area B at sundown. Uh, um, uh, so, so kind of shared control between the the uh, Israeli army and and um, and and the Palestinian Authority's forces. And then in Area C, they're not allowed to function at all. And then Jerusalem was completely considered outside the scope of this. So the the PLA is not allowed to function at all in in Jerusalem. And and Israel has uh, like where once Jerusalem was the focal point also for a lot of Palestinian mobilization. Um, you know, there was political leadership in Jerusalem. Uh, there was there was these institutions that allowed for for um, you, you know to, to kind of like help other parts of the Palestinian territories mobilize around shared objectives and things like this. Like we saw the unified national leadership of the uprising during the first Intifada. Many of them were from Jerusalem. Um, but like since 1994 and since this kind of geographic fragmentation, Israel has basically been eradicating Palestinian life in Jerusalem, you know, cutting off suburbs of Jerusalem um, with the with the segregation wall, closing down these Palestinian civil society organizations, increasing settlements and what remains of Palestinian Jerusalem and, you know, all the home demolitions and all of these things. So, um, so the, the Palestinian Authority, even though it's supposed to have some level of control in some parts of the territories, essentially like, you know, just the uh, they're basically beholden to to the Israeli occupation. So the, the Israeli occupation is constantly having incursions in all the areas, and the settlements continue to expand. There's not really any respect for even the the fragments that they were given. So I'm I'm sure your listeners, or maybe your listeners, have seen um you know the maps of the West Bank, for example. They're they're often referred to as like Swiss cheese because there's absolutely no territorial you know contiguity. Um, and then the, the other thing that was signed along with the Oslo Accords peace process was the Protocol on um, Economic Relations, which basically made the Palestinian economy subservient to Israel's. So anything coming in and out has to be approved by Israel. Uh, the Palestinians have to use the Israeli currency. Um, the, the Israelis collect taxes uh, on Palestinian imports, and it's supposed to be returned to the Palestinian Authority, but they often withhold it for political purposes. And um, and even though those taxes are like a major source of the Palestinian Authority's revenue. So um, basically, you know, I, I highlight in the book how um, after 1994 and particularly, so I, I look at it in different phases, but particularly after um, what I consider the consolidation of the Palestinian Authority after the 2006 uh, elections, um, Palestinians have become quite demobilized and it's not just the geographic fragmentation, although that plays a, a large role, but it's also this kind of social fragmentation that has emerged because the Palestinian Authority plays a very particular role um, in in uh, in dividing society. So let's get a bit more into the the latter, the, the last bit you said about how the role of the PA, especially, but um, not to not to remove focus from the Israeli occupation. It's just I think it's. It's kind of the elephant in the room, and I would hope most people already know this. Uh, but I mean, we'll talk about this anyway. But before before getting into the the role of the PA, would you mind just um, explaining some of the terms that we will just be using, maybe interchangeably, like the PA, PNA, Fatah, PLO? Again, uh, people can be confused with these terms because they they tend to be used interchangeably, especially in the past decade or so. If the, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, I, uh, too many um, acronyms, I think. But um, so basically, the Palestinian Authority, like I said, was this this governing apparatus that was created out of the Oslo Accords. Um, but the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, was founded in 1964, considered the representative of the Palestinian people. It has many different institutions within it. It has the executive committee, has the legislative body, but um, it, it's supposed to be representative of Palestinians within historic Palestine, Palestine, Palestinians outside of historic Palestine, um, and and encompasses a number of different political parties. Fatah is one of those political parties, which is a member of the PLO, um, and it is the most popular historically uh, amongst Palestinians, and it's it's you know considered the most powerful uh, within the PLO um, prior to 1990 or even now prior to 1994, especially. So Yasser Arafat was from Fatah. So he also served as the chairman of the PLO. And then when the Palestinian Authority was created, the PLO was supposed to kind of remain the umbrella organization, but it quickly fell into disuse, we can say. Um, the, the Palestinian Authority took precedence and became kind of the main negotiating body. Um, and Yasser Arafat had returned to, to the Palestinian, Palestinian territories and, and, and he ran for elections and won by something like 88%. So he became the president of the Palestinian Authority as well. Now, um, 
I think maybe why these things have become kind of interchangeable is because when they've had parliamentary elections, particularly the, the 2006 parliamentary elections, um, the, the free and fair elections were not respected. Um, and um, I mean, we can get into this in more detail maybe uh, later, but um, essentially like, Fatah retained control of the Palestinian Authority, even though they do not have a mandate to govern, even though they did not actually win those elections. And so for a lot of these reasons that, you know, there's there's a conflation sometimes. And then because the PLO has been kind of sidelined, you know, um, now there's calls to 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 uh, do uh, elections for the legislative body of the PLO. But um, because it was also sidelined, like the PA became kind of the bigger, bigger, you know, uh, uh, party in town, a uh, bigger institution in town. Um, so, so yeah, um, I think that's why there's some confusion over the terms. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to get into the 2006 uh, elections anyway. That was the next question. Um, I'll preface it by saying that even in, the reason why I'm asking that specific question is that even in, you know, sympathetic pro-Palestine media, as far as I can tell anyway, I, I don't often see too much analysis of the role of the PA specifically, or the role of the of the quote unquote, or at least the the de facto government in, entity, at least in Area C, as you said, uh, Area A. Sorry, it's sort of assumed or maybe implied that because um, Israel occupies militarily occupies quote unquote their territory, so like the territory of the PA and the territory of Hamas in, in Gaza. In Gaza Therefore, their role isn't as important. And again, I, I obviously don't want to dismiss the overarching role of the Israeli occupation, all of this. Um, but not doing so, I think, tends to ignore important facts. You just mentioned 2006 elections, um, which gave Hamas a victory. Uh, since 2006, the PA didn't really allow for any elections. And we're now, what, 15 years later, and there may be elections in July, from what I understand. Uh, crucially, though, and this is what I think is usually missed, the PA has managed to achieve, and here I'm kind of rehashing a bit already what you said, so maybe just to use it to get back into it a bit more. I suppose like because of its organic ties to Palestinian society, managed to achieve something that the Israeli occupation prior to 1994 didn't seem to have really achieved. And, and here I'm quoting, polarize and demobilize, of course, the title of the book, a Palestinian population, end quote. And I'm not even including in, in what I'm saying here, like Hamas and Hamas's authoritarianism in Gaza, because that's an entire thing in itself as well. So like, in terms of the processes, you, as I said, you already started getting into this. How did they manage to do that? And how would you describe the quote unquote situation now in terms of, uh, well, in terms of mobilization or demobilization for that matter and polarization. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to re-summarize the book in some ways, I guess. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, yeah, so, so, so I argue in the book that um, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, was, like you said, able to accomplish this kind of fragmentation and polarization in conjunction with Israeli repression and Israeli geographical fragmentation of, of the Palestinian territories for, for two reasons. One, they were empowered by external patrons, particularly the United States, who encouraged them from the onset to be exclusionary. Um, or sometimes it's not even encouragement, it's like pressure. Sometimes it's like direct you know, involvement to force them to be exclusionary. Um, and, and, and two, they, the Palestinian Authority was very embedded, like I said, in the Palestinian society in ways that the Israelis weren't. So like the Israelis you know, uh, prior to 1904 have like attempted sometimes to put, like, to put up like collaborationist institutions as like a front try to get Palestinians to, to engage with these collaborative institutions, but it didn't work as well as when the PA started playing this role. And, and to be clear, like, like exactly like you said, like I'm not dismissing the Israeli occupation at all. Uh, it is, is the root cause, um, but, and I don't think the PA is an evil entity or anything. So some, you know, I know that some of the leadership benefits from the status quo. I know of course that there's cor corruption, um, but a lot of people also who took part in the state building project like thought that this was their best option. Um, and, and they tried to maintain, and, and you know, if, if we have to recall also that this was after like, what, four or five years of like a grueling uprising where like people like, you know, Yitzhak Rabin was like d using a break the bones policy and like, you know, people people will, needed, you know, another option. And, and, and they tried to maintain, I'd say in some aspects, a semblance of independence. But in the end, this is a project that, you know, 
pretends at self-determination, pretends at sovereignty, but, but can't hold the occupier accountable and is pe penned in by the United States and, and its Western allies. So, so the, the Palestinian Authority, you know, cows to their external patrons and those pressures at the expense of public accountability. Um, and, and they fragment uh, Palestinian society, Palestinian civil society in a couple of ways. So I outline in the book um, how they, they increase in celerity within groups and, and, and grievances between them by being selective about who they repress and who they co-opt. So, so for example, um, you know, and I, and I use this example in the book. So when certain like popular communities emerge in villages, like, you know, they, they mobilize around the issue of the wall, around the issue of like land theft and, and land confiscation, the, the Palestinian Authority, you know, would try to get involved. They try to come into the protests as like photo ops. Um, they try to speak to the organizers, try to get them to like, quote unquote, coordinate with the Palestinians, the, the, the Palestinian Authority's official committee on resistance against the wall. Um, and some and some of these activists were even hired away from their villages and and began working for the official committee. So so now essentially they're not working on the ground in their villages. They're working in Ramallah, and and it's just you know that's just one example of how how some of this cooptation is used. Um, and this breeds a lot of resentment between groups uh, like you know groups that decided to work with the Palestinian Authority, groups that didn't. And then even within the groups between leadership and like the membership and the rank and file membership, many, many people I spoke with were, were, were frustrated at what they saw their, you know, their leadership was like falling for the Palestinian Authority's cooptation. So then there's this, you know, that dynamic. And then there's this, you know, second aspect where there's a segment of the population that's reliant on the Palestinian Authority for employment. And so that's one way. And then, and, and of course, there's also the straightforward repression. So that's often at the behest of, uh, and of the Israeli occupation and in coordination with the Israeli occupation, you know, to prove that they're good partners, to prove that there would be no more unrest, to prove that, you know, um, Islamists won't win elections, all of these things, and to continue the negotiation process. But the, this really pushes certain groups to the margins. So, so like, certain groups feel like they can't engage in politics or represent their views. And, and there's more insularity there. There's less coordination between them and other groups um, and, and more a turn to armed resistance also and the use of like uh, those kinds of strategies instead of, um, you know, instead of uh, uh, nonviolent strategies um, or, or more, co you know, coordinated uh, um, shared strategies with broader segments of the Palestinian population. Uh, would you would you say like this is a form of NGOization or is it a different phenomenon? Um, so so NGOization, uh, you know, is is a it, it's it's coming concurrently, but I wouldn't say it's it's exactly the same. Um, so so NGOization was um, essentially like you know, aside from all the ways that I just described, uh, you know, regarding cooptation and oppression and its impacts, this. Um, this concept of NGOization was discussed by Tarek Dana and, and Manal Jamal and, and a number of other Palestinians. And I think they're using a term coined by Arundhati Roy uh, on a similar dynamic in, in India. So um, essentially grassroots organizations that used to be quite responsive to society are now more in the business of competing for grants from international donors. So yeah, exactly. again, we have this dynamic where they're like beholden to the external patron rather than the people they're attempting to serve. Um, but I wouldn't characterize you know, the, this exactly the same as what's happening with the PA, because rather I would characterize both as a as an issue of what we call like a principal agent problem um, in in kind of like the policy literature. Um, and then there's also this aspect of NGOization where like activism or advocacy becomes a profession. So it's like a living for a certain subset of the middle or upper middle class. So all of this, you know, all of these things I've just described make Palestinians, you know, quite um, uh, directionless and so like the institutions which once channeled uh their grievances like don't necessarily exist anymore um yeah thanks for that by the way so since publishing the book we've we you know which is as i said focus on the Oslo accords and what came since we've seen the so-called abraham accords and i think they're even vaguer than the Oslo accords and obviously like that's on purpose the the, the plo i mean the pa sorry were, were not even consulted really in that in the first place they're not really part of that um, which again, I guess is by design, and its signatories don't even seem to know how to package it to either domestic, regional, or international audiences. I mean, it's kind of all over the place, depending on which day you read their you know, statements and so on. 
And I don't say this to diminish that because, as you know, I think it should be obvious by now that they have already brought about their fair share of, like, their courts have brought about their fair share of negative consequences. But just to note how, like, even more internationalized this story is getting, and not for the better. Would, you know, as someone who's written the book, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot when it was published, I think 2018, 2019. Um, would you have added? 2019, 2020, sorry. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Would you have added anything? Uh, have you, like, had you finished it after the Abraham Accords? Like, did it sort of confirm anything that you were discussing in the book or, you know, maybe adding something or something else? Um, so if I had, like, waited on this and, like, seen the Abraham Accords unfold, um, so maybe I would have touched upon the regional dimension and how it poses uh, new challenges to Palestinians. Um, so like kind of the transnational authoritarian dynamics that are expanding uh, because of these Abraham Accords um, and the lead up to them and the aftermath of them and, and how that, you know, that tra kind of transnational authoritarianism is changing and in character, how it's going to have an impact on our, you know, when I say our, our Palestinians, um, on Palestinians' regional allies in the public sphere in many of these countries, and how it poses an, you know, an added obstacle um, on how even the Palestinian diaspora will will be able to engage in the future. So, I, I may have I have touched up on that, but um, that's actually that's actually the the, the the topic of my second book. Um, so you know, uh, well, mention it that wasn't then. included, but yeah. yeah. Well, mention the second book then, if you don't mind. Yeah, so, so the second book is, is um, looking at, um, you know, transnational authoritarian dynamics um, uh, and, and particularly the role of Israel in, in facilitating a lot of these transnational authoritarian, you know, uh, uh, practices or dynamics. And um, I mean, it's still quite a work in progress. It's, it's quite early, but um, I have been in the region a couple of years uh, 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 since, you know, since I got my PhD and um, I've done a you know some field work and 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 um, some you know um, you know ethnographic uh, 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 work on 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 dynamics that have been unfolding um, and it's really quite interesting to see uh, how civil society organizations have been impacted by the growing closeness uh, between Israel and um, some of these countries and and I wanted to kind of you know tease out what that means for um, uh, you know how people hold their governments accountable and um, how how people can also organize with each other uh, effectively or not. I don't know if that was very a very good explainer. Not at all a very good <laughs> elevator pitch. <laughs> it was, it was, and I mean, I, I, I definitely would be very interested in that topic as well. Um, just to go back a bit, like it is 2021, and I'm I'm trying with as many of these um, episodes on the region to have some kind of 2011 angle to them, like the, like Arab Spring angle to them. Um, I have a number of questions on that, but I'll start with just like the you you started the conversation with with like the Arab Spring being also part of your own motivation. So like, how would you assess the impact of the Arab Spring on Palestinian politics? Um, yeah, just that question actually. How would you assess it? So so I would I think that the Arab Spring could have had a big role on Palestinian politics, especially given how unifying the Palestinian issue was uh, for those initial protests. And and even yeah. in the lead up to the Arab Spring, there's quite a bit of evidence that shows how many activists like turned to the idea of democracy and were socialized in these ideas via their work on pro-Palestinian activism. And we see we see this in, especially in the context of Egypt. Um, so so the Arab Spring was 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 this opportunity to, per, to perhaps exert regional pressure on the Palestinian issue, but unfortunately that didn't come to pass. So Palestinians themselves were were quite supportive of the Arab Spring uprisings and and very sympathetic to what happened, like for example in Rabaa. Um, uh, even though there was you know some element of polarization around like the Islamist parties and the, because the people who criticized you know Hamas also. Uh, um, criticized the Muslim Brotherhood. But in the end, I would say Palestinians were, were quite supportive of democracy movements in the region. And um, I, I I think that, you know, it's not like the, the Palestinians had mass mass protests or like anything similar, but they, for, you know, for a brief moment, um, there was like this hope that the Palestinian question would be, re, you know, uh, revitalized um, and, and put on center stage uh, for, um, it, 
for the rest of the region. Um, and, and there was many indications that that could have come to pass had, had uh, the Arab Spring not been, you know, usurped. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the motivation behind that question is this very difficult topic. So like, I, I don't expect you to have the perfect answer or whatever, but just part of how, part of my way of thinking through these things as well. But we do know that authoritarian groups and governments throughout the region, like from Syria to Lebanon to Iran to whatever, they, they tend to bring up Palestine quite a lot. It's obviously part, it's a central part of their own uh, rhetoric and their own narratives for their own purposes, obviously. It does seem from the outside, never been able to go to Palestine. I just, you know, Lebanese citizens so not exactly easy. Um, it does seem to have at least worked with a percentage of the population, even though probably a minority, especially part of the political elites. Of course, we, the issue with the, the situation in Hamas is kind of complicated. I don't fully understand that there was in the early days uh, support for the uprising, the, the, the revolution. There was even, you know, reports of presence of Hamas in Syria, or at least some kind of advisory in an advisory setting. Anyway, with the PA, is, it's definitely more, more complicated as far as I can tell. And it's not, my question isn't really just about like, so what do Hamas or PA think about the, the, the revolution? It doesn't interest me as much. But what would you, how would you say the role of these authoritarian groups, how have they been perceived as far as you can tell within these uh, dynamics that we've been discussing so far, if at all? Yeah, so, so um, I would say like, kind of like, these, you know, counter-revolutionary, like authoritarian groups, um, like the tanky rhetoric is, is not really as widespread as, you know, what some, you know, pontificators on Twitter or in the media might give the impression. Like, like we saw in Gaza, like uh, Qasem Soleimani's billboards went up and were immediately vandalized. Um, and, and I think that some polling, like I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, I can, I can, Look it up and send it to you. But um, I know I, I, there, you know we poll the Palestinians just like we poll the rest of the Arab world. I, you know, in a number of different regional surveys, um, and I and I don't think that Iran is particularly uh, uh, um, popular amongst Palestinian public. Um, but when you ask the question, like, you know, um, you know, how how do Palestinians like see these events? Like, I remember there was a lot of you know, like I said, an, an outpouring of support for Rabah. Um, and, and that's not, that wasn't just from like an Islamist, you know, subsection of the population. Like they, mm -hmm. that people, people genuinely felt for what happened to the, you know, the, the democracy movements in Egypt. People were very sympathetic to, to Syria. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, we should compromise ourselves morally by supporting any of any, you know Iran or Hezbollah or Assad or, or or even just staying quiet about them so as not to lose potential allies you know um, because you know I, I I speak for myself here but I think that this is a wide sentiment um, you know Palestine is an issue of self determination for an indigenous Arab population in the case of Palestine it's against settler colonialism but the other movements in the region are also calls for an attempt at self determination and you know, I think most people recognize like you can't possibly support one without supporting other manifestations of the struggle. But you're right that there is this kind of, um, you know, there is this kind of division between some parts of the political elite and 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 the rest of the Palestinian public. Um, but I would not, you know, I would say that that's not very representative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for that as well. Um, it sort of brings me to the to the, the the wider question, and that's kind of a very difficult one. Not that these questions were easy thus, uh, thus far, but you tweeted recently, and I just wrote it down, and just I'll just I'll just read it. And I I know you you, I don't know. It's it's a difficult one. So yeah. Uh, so I'm quoting. Have we considered the social impacts of long-term authoritarianism on what it normalizes, how it impacts people's sense of shared humanity? There's work on the impact of authoritarian legacies on attitudes, but it really is only scratching the surface. Wider picture is much worse, uh, end quote. I have some thoughts about this, but I'll first just ask you to sort of, um, yeah, expand as much as you can in some ways. And what, how, why did you, what, what brought this about? Yeah, um, so I'm going to try to answer this as best as I can. And if, if, I, if I'm being too vague or something, like, please ask me to elaborate on the points <laughs> yeah, that I fine. should elaborate on. Um, so, so I guess, I mean, I was just thinking and, and lamenting, like, the, the, you know, 
the the conditions I see around me. Like authoritarianism clearly impacts social ties, and it clearly impacts people's mindsets uh, of people who you know have lived under particular types of authoritarianism. You see it in how people engage with each other. Like people who grew up in Ba'athist Syria engage differently than people, you know, and, and people who grew up under Mubarak and people, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's um, you know, you can't just get rid of these years of social socialization. And, and there's actually research um, on this. Uh, there was a recent special issue in comparative political studies that, that um, shows how, you know, people who grow up during their formative years, like between 15 and 20 years old under certain types of authoritarian regimes are actually like more, uh, less likely to be supportive of democracy. Um, but, but these studies are, you know, scratching at the surface at the end of the day, like they're looking at particular attitudes and st stuff like that. And I think it's, it goes beyond just an attitude, to, you know, for or against democracy or how much for and against democracy. It's, it's, it's also about how people engage with each other. And, and that's kind of what I was, I was thinking about. Like, when, when you have uh, a society that's lived, you know, 30, 40 years under particular regimes, um, socialized in a particular way, the institutions are set up to discourage critical thinking and discourage people, you know, um, trusting each other and things like that. Like, how, how do you, how do you do, how do you get past that, you know? Um, and it almost seems, like I said, it almost seems like these are generational issues. Like, I don't really know how you can rebuild uh, the social ties and like the critical thinking between people who have been like ripped apart by repression and inundated by disinformation and propaganda. And the answer for me seems to be like to focus on uh, young people, make sure that, you know, they're getting better ideas during their formative year and, and provide, you know, figuring out what spaces there are for them to build those better ideas. And like, I've seen very interesting like student activism in places you wouldn't, you wouldn't think there was. Um, and, and ways that people are socialized into kind of being, having more democratic uh, values um, in, in, in kind of unlikely places. Um, but like, I, I think that's, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not an important person. I'm not an activist, you know, like my, I'm just an academic. And for me, my personal role is to kind of try to analyze these patterns and like figure out, you know, what's working, what's not, and try as much as possible to like engage in public facing scholarship so that people benefit from my findings. So figuring out like what spaces are effective in breaking these patterns? How do you break through government propaganda? Um, what initiatives have been most effective? And, and that, you know, that's my personal role in this, but um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of rambled, but. <laughs> no, you did, you did. And I mean, I, I, I kind of, you know, Screw it back at you just because it's something that it, it's one of the underlying themes of, of this podcast as well. And I am at a particular position in like I'm in a particular place in my life right now, like where my formative years were, I was 14 when Javier was killed, right, in 2005. And everything that happened since the assassinations, the war, the other war, uh, the Arab Spring and everything that followed, all of that were my teenage and then my 20s. Maybe I'm thinking like this because it's been a, exactly 10 years since the Arab Spring and that's kind of a symbolism behind the, you know, a decade or because I'm turning 30 or what have you. But I, I tend to be very worried, uh, or to put it very mildly, actually, I'm, I'm to be very worried about how... Um, People like us, let's say, I'm just going to say millennials to, to be simpler, tend to be a bit dismissive of the things that, uh, let's say, Gen Zers have to go through because we overly generalizing here, of course. But in my experience, and I'll just stick to Lebanon, I have this um, memory of in my early activist days, I was I was participating with something called Save Beirut Heritage, and I've mentioned the story before. But we were just trying to like put us to preserve this like nice building that was being destroyed because that happened a lot in the privatizations of stuff in Beirut. And I just remember I was like 16, 17, 18. Every time I tell this story, I, I give myself a different age because I can't remember what time it was. But like teenage years, more or less. And there, I just remember this old lady in her 50s, I think, or 60s telling me like, um, I'll, I'll say it in Arabic and then translate like, 
like don't mm. don't bother I don't guess. waste your time yeah yeah don't waste your time basically saying like they're going to destroy it anyway and mm. that had an impact on me growing up and it had i think in retrospect a role in not radic- like de-radicalizing me i guess or whatever like just making me less politically active as i might have been otherwise until years later when i oh, i became more politically active a few years later and i do worry that since in the context of lebanon since the uprising since the revolution october 2019 we have seen pretty good developments happening in student circles uh good like yeah. secular and progressive and feminist and all of these things happening winning seats and winning like percentage of the votes that as far as i can remember didn't really happen before Definitely mm-hmm. not while I was at, at the American University of Beirut. We had some success with the secular club, which is still ongoing and should be supported, but not as much as now, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't see, again, people like me, my age, a bit older, a bit younger, whatever, thinking that this really matters. So like we, we, we tend to be very cynical about their future because we are, understandably so, cynical about our own futures, about our own immediate future, especially. And that sort of worries me due to the, you know, the potential of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy, essentially. Like they need to be supported at that specific amount. Like they need to be supported right now. And they need to be told that they are part of something that's bigger than them. And it is happening. I'm not saying it's not happening, but not as much as I think it should uh, be happening right now. And so, yeah, sorry, you're saying. No, no, I, I'm I'm reflecting on what you're what you're saying, and um, I mean p- perhaps the the specific context in Lebanon, like you did have, you know, these protests, and people who are young, and engaging in these protests or witnessing these protests, they will have, perhaps, um, yeah, I and mean, we can have a more optimistic outlook on their politics, uh, you know, in the future, but I, I, you know, K, you know, regions in the Arab world differ, in some cases our generation was socialized on the Arab Spring and like maybe slightly older than us, like people witnessed the second Intifada, for example, they went, you know, know, these things were like very powerful to them. And what I'm hearing from activists, like let's say in the Gulf, is that like, we're quite concerned that the young are not, like they do not have a living memory of some of these events. Um, And so they're being, their formative years are are being, um, what's the word? Like, they're, they're going in a very different direction. They're consuming, you know, this like neoliberal discourse about tolerance and like all these things instead of what we consumed and what we, we had growing up. But I mean, you know, whether it's the Lebanese example where it's like, there is, a, there is an opportunity there, we just need to support them. Or where, it, you know, the Gulf example where it's like, well, like things, you know, the circumstances are quite bad and like we need to take on a more active role in like facilitating an alternative viewpoint for these for these kids. Like the strategies differ, but the idea is like we can kind of, you know, see, seize our own agency to try to, um, to, to kind of to, 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 to change the narrative and, 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 and yeah, I mean, not have another generation you know, be witness to such horrifying failures and, and have the cynicism and, and you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that made, made any sense, but. It did, it did. And yeah, yeah again, um, it's sort of like, and to, to be clear, I don't, I don't think that because they have better politics than we did that necessarily their lives are gonna be any easier. Like there are very difficult things happening right now in Lebanon and it's just objective to say that it's probably going to be difficult for the foreseeable future. Um, that's just the situation. That's just a fact. Uh, I guess I'm just thinking of they may have to deal with the, and this is like probably very Lebanon specific. I'll just say it anyway. But my best guess is that the sectarian regime is a dying one. It's not one that is, it's very fragile, like just objectively. It, it, it tends to rely on a lot of violence and a lot of clientelism. And at some point 
neither of these two really work, especially in the long term. But it being uh, fragile or weak or whatever does not mean that it doesn't have a lot of violence up its sleeves. And that's sort of my worry. My worry is that they will have to deal with potentially more violence than, than I had to deal with. I didn't, I didn't deal with much violence. And between 2010, 2013 in Lebanon, there wasn't that much. I mean, especially compared to the region. Um, since 2019, it's been increasing. And there is a trend, obviously, with Lokman Slim's assassination. So there's this trend of it going in a certain direction, which hopefully it doesn't. But the long-term impact of authoritarianism, I guess the generational anger that I'm talking about is that I, I, I saw how it affected my parents, right? I saw how they, they are the war generation. So like they are the ones who, which is the shit title, but whatever. But mm. they are the ones who really, their formative years was literally the war. Like they were 15 until their 30s, until, you know. Um, and I saw them not really do a good job without judging them. It's nothing personal. I mean, it is. <laughs> but it's, it's you know, it's understandable. It's understandable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at explaining what they went through in order for us to sort of move on from it. And that goes back to the structure. It's not just them. It's, it's an institutionalized situation in Lebanon. We just don't talk about the war. They obviously the warlords are where they are. They're still there. They're right. in power. Right, right. And I, it's not the same to like with regards to the next generations, our relationship to them, because this it's the same warlords. So it's not like a new situation in the first place. And I do think that they are more likely to then be at my current age, let's say, with a lot of these warlords actually having passed away because they're pretty old right now, hopefully, and. Yeah, so it's just a question in my mind, and it, it came at a good time. Like you tweeted this out just before while I was uh, writing down the questions for for this episode as well, and it's definitely something that deserves its own, you know, in depth, um, you know, episode or whatever. But I mean, thanks for answering it anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned, um, like we mentioned it on and off, and the the role of the U.S. in all of this because. Um, from what I can tell from the statistics of people who listen, it's this, the second highest um, percentage of like the audience comes from the US, um, just because it's in English. So like, I would venture to guess that a lot of people listening are like vaguely liberal, progressive, leftist, whatever. Um, they know that the role of the US isn't exactly good. You know, I think that's pretty basic. But I don't think they fully understand, and just as I, up until fairly recently, didn't fully understand the details, like to what extent the U.S. is actually, like the role of the U.S. is actually pretty big. So would you mind just getting into this a bit more? Yeah. Um, so so I'm I'm going to talk about it in the case in the context of Palestine, but and but the U.S. plays quite an outsized role in in a number of different countries. Now that might be changing. There might be other regional actors kind of, uh, um, you know, expanding the sure, scope yeah. of their their activities. But, but at you know, at the time of the writing, and specifically in in the case of Palestine, like the U.S. is quite central to my to my to my analysis and to the, to the to the book's argument, because it was at the helm of creating this dynamic between Palestinian society and its leadership, and and often uh, pushed the PA to engage in ways that. Uh, in, in which they were unaccountable to their public. So the 2006 elections was an example of that. Um, like even before the, the 2006 elections, there had been a lot of pressure on the PA and, and we, saw, we saw this through the WikiLeaks dump, uh, the, the Palestine papers. There had been a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, pressure on them to repress their uh, political opponents um, even before the Islamists won any elections. So the US and the UK were trying to tell the PA to like arrest people, trying to tell them to like make sure that they don't, uh, you know, have these spaces to organize. But then the 2006 elections happened, Hamas won, the Hamas party won, uh, you know, fair and free elections by all election monitoring standards. Um, but, uh, but the US, you know, imposed sanctions, it posed, you know, very quite severe pressure on the Palestinian economy and the Palestinian public. Um, then when they would like create these mechanisms, like I can't remember what they called them, like aid stop cap, you know, mechanisms or whatever, just like to get aid to the Palestinian people, but like not through proper channels, they literally would 
you know, uh, yeah, deposit money in personal bank accounts of, of like Mahmoud Abbas and like, you know, you know what I mean? So, so like, you know, how, how, what better like example to illustrate like how much they kind of diverted uh, um, uh, the ability of the Palestinian public to like impose pressure on its own leadership. Um, so that was, and, and then eventually what happened was the, you know, the Palestinian authority, the, the outgoing party, Fatah, like, did not accept those elections, overturned them. There was violence uh, between the Palestinian uh, factions, and it led to the basically Gaza and the West Bank like being completely uh, uh, separated and governed by two different bodies, which continues till this day. Um, so the U.S. is like really at at the crux of this, and 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 the crux of pressuring the PA. But there's also like even like they they even get involved in the nitty gritty of managing the Palestinian Authority's coercive apparatus. Like they control who gets promotions, who gets ahead within the Palestinian Authority's bureaucracies. They control how aid is spent. They conduct trainings with the, with, you know, the, um, the security forces. Like, I, you know, there's, there's just many ways that the U.S. has from the onset of the Oslo Accords, from like at the time of like the writing, at the time of the negotiations, before the Oslo Accords were even announced to the public, to today, has been quite, uh, um, you know, kind of like a, a interjecting between the Palestinian Authority and, um, you know, the Palestinian public. Um, and I talk about that uh, to some degree in the uh, in in the first half of the book. And there is some. I mean, there are lots of questions as to like how much this is going to change under Biden compared to under Trump. We have seen already indications of of uh, the answer being not much. Um, we know that the administration um, has recently, like, vocally opposed the, the international um, criminal court. Criminal court, thank you. Um, decision to investigate the, the the what I think they call it the Palestinian situation or whatever. Yeah. Um, capital, capitalized Palestinian <laughs> yeah. situation. Um, so, like. I don't know how more obvious it can get, but that's that's a question that I always get asking because it does get always worse. Um, would you say that there might be any difference? I mean, so I'll, I'll say the reason why I ask this, not because I personally believe in Joe Biden or anything like that. The reason why I think that there might be some potential there is simply the like the base of the Democratic Party, or at least a a, a percentage, a significant and increasingly vocal percentage of the Democratic Party which is definitely way more progressive than than the people at the top, right? And, you know, of course, think of Ilhan Omar and obviously think of AOC and all of the others, but also like just like a Jewish voice for peace or if not now, and I, I don't know what the percentage of their membership is, but it's getting, it's different. It's definitely different than it was when it was just like, we were amazed that Bernie said anything really. And that was already a massive, Thing. I mean, expectations are very low. I should I should say like I think my, my expectations of that are very low, and that's why I'm I'm a bit surprised at times. Would you say that there might be some potential there? Um, and like, feel free to answer however you want on this. Um, yeah, I mean, like I I also recognize that there is a shift in the democratic base, but um, you know, the American system is quite slow moving, and most of like there's a lot of disenfranchisement in the United States and it's not a, like, you know, a, f a 100% responsive or like um, representative system. So like there are certain segments within the Democratic Party and then within, you know, politics, American politics as a whole that like have an outsized role. Um, I think that continues. And I, I don't see that changing in four years, especially given, you know, they, they the, the conditions that the United States finds itself in. Um, so like, I don't, you know, people people might have very good ideas. And I and, and even within, like you said, like even within the American Jewish community, like you're seeing like very positive shifts, but like um, unprecedented positive shifts, but like, are you gonna sell it to the American people? Like, you know, care about X when, you know, the economy is collapsing or all these things, you know what I mean? So like, and also, obviously, the institutions of the American political system are quite slow. Um, I, I would say that, like, like obviously, Biden is better than Trump. Like, Trump was like a disaster and has, you know, created precedents that, like, 
even Biden isn't going to overturn. And you know what I mean? Like just, just absolutely horrendous. Um, but um, I think that really like it has always come down to like whether or not Palestinian leadership like would exercise their own agency and actually like change, you know, the status quo. Like they have had opportunities in which they were like, you know, basically cornered like up against the wall. Um, and they could have had a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, support and legitimacy for like saying like, no, we want to break from this or like, you know, the, the farthest they went was like ending security coordination for like a little bit. But, but they're not fully seizing, you know, the, the opportunities to like uh, break free of this, 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 uh, you know, um, patron, you know, patron uh, uh, dynamic. Um, and, and, and I think the calls to um, reform the PLO could, could, you know, fall into that of like being able to exercise the agency and like, uh, instead of waiting for an American administration to like change a little bit or like the American public to like come around or anything like, not that that's not important, but uh, you know, we could just exercise agency um, in, in, in some small ways, but I think that there hasn't been enough uh, um, like forethought. Is that the word for, you know, foresight, forethought? I don't know. Foresight, yeah. <laughs> foresight. Oh, gosh, the English is not, not my, not my strong suit, but um, yeah. So, so there hasn't been enough, like, like uh, forward thinking to like take those steps and, uh, and there's two, you know, they've just been, perpetuating the status quo and I don't, I don't know what what the end result is going to be yeah uh, we have was supposed to be seeing two upcoming elections the israeli one and the palestinian one i don't i don't see much change happening on the israeli side obviously but is there anything that you think can happen from the upcoming palestinian one assuming they do happen uh i haven't seen that much optimism i think that's that's fair to say so i don't know if from your side you've seen something that i've missed so no, I, I, I wouldn't say like, like elections are not like a, a beyond end all for like resolving any of these problems. And I actually, I think that like um, making it a, a, a political context over contest over elections when there are like underlying issues that need to be resolved first, like that's actually quite problematic. Like yeah. Yeah. Gaza and the West Bank continue to be separated. Like, why are we discussing election? You know what I mean? Like there are other things that should be resolved. However, I think that you know, elections within the PLO, within the legislative body of the PLO might be a better, um, you know, uh, thing to ask for. It might be, it might be a better demand. Um, because, I mean, I, I've been saying this for a little bit. A lot of other Palestinians have been saying this for a while. Like, you know, the PLO needs to be revived because the way in which the Palestinian cause has gone, the, 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 the trajectory it has gone is that it has been, com you know, um, completely cut off from the vast majority of like the Palestinian experience. So like it's become an issue of just Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. And obviously like they are bearing the brunt of what's happening. So like, I'm not saying like they shouldn't be at the, at the crux of, you know, deciding what happens, but like there's the issues of people in Jerusalem. There's the issues of the right, the, you know, the Palestinians it, refugees and their right of return. Like all of these issues that once were encompassed in the PLO's objectives and demands, like they, they have been completely sidelined. And that has been a weakness for the Palestinians themselves and the Palestinian leadership themselves. Like, like in an era without the internet, the Palestinian diaspora was much more connected to what was happening on the ground than it is today. And we have all these technologies and we're still like, we are still seeing a huge disconnect because the PLO and its institutions that used to organize Palestinians like no longer exists. So I think like a lot of people have been asking for this and I think that that's a way forward is to try to, you know, the, the elections within the PLO might be a way forward, but um, I don't think that necessarily like elections are, 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 are the way to resolve some of the existential issues within the Palestinian Authority. Um, and especially given the Palestinian Authority has done like has expended a lot of effort to like make sure that like opposition won't necessarily be able to win. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I I'm not very optimistic about those elections either. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's I think that's a very fair answer. Um, so like we'll get into the book section. Are there any any uh, well? Do you have three books to recommend to the audiences? And uh, yeah, let's just talk about them. Yeah. So I I thought about this question a little bit because I. Um, I didn't want to like be completely off topic and like 
like I, I'm not a very good researcher because I allow myself to read too widely and like <laughs> spend time on like novels and like things like this that aren't helping my work. But like, um, I would say uh, three books. Um, one is um, uh, How Social Movements Die by Christian Davenport. Um, it, it talks about, uh, you know, the, the case of like African-American uh, 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 and like black power um, uh, groups in, in the United States, but it's quite an interesting book and uh, um, was informative for me. Um, okay, so so the second book is um, Lisa Blades' book, uh, State of Repression, um, uh, which she looks at, like she uses archival research um, to, to examine the impact of repression on polarization in uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq. Um, and um, yeah, so so there's some like I think her argument like and my argument kind of like overlap in some ways and and um, it, I think they are useful to be read together um, because she kind of has has particular uh, analysis that like I don't have you know um, so so that's really interesting to see kind of some of the similar dynamics play out in a different case and then um, the third book I would say is I I read like. I'd say two months ago is um, Inside the Battle of Algiers by uh, Zohra Abu Dhrib. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced her name in the Algerian way properly, but um, <laughs> that was really interesting because it was just her memoir of like, um, you know, this self-determination struggle in uh, 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 Algeria um, under French occupation. So that was really interesting. Not so much for me, like I, I'm not like a scholar of insurgency. So like I, I wasn't necessarily as interested in like, you know the tactics they used or anything even though that was like quite interesting but um i i was i was more fascinated by the discourse and like the justifications and like how they themselves saw their struggle i thought um like should be read widely by palestinians and 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 people who care about you know arab self-determination uh, yeah, so I mean, since you mentioned Algeria, I'll just say that I've contributed a book chapter to a book called A Region in Revolt, Mapping the Recent Uprisings in North Africa and West Asia, and has a very good chapter on Algeria by Hamza Hamushin, and I, don't, I also don't know if I'm pronouncing their family yeah. name. I, I apologize, Hamza, if you're listening, and Salma Omari, <laughs> and it's a really good chapter as well. It goes through the, the recent Algerian uprising, and the book, I should say, also mentions uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, and Sudan, and Sudan, and Algeria. Is so this book out? Also, yeah, it's out. Oh, that's awesome. So, okay. I mean, Dana, thanks thanks a lot for your time. This has really been very informative. And um, yeah, just thank you for condensing so much dense material into about an hour. No, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And um, sorry if I was a little bit vague. We, we like no, to speak in general fine. terms. <laughs>
To fire these times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.